Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing about a few multiple choice questions which are of utmost importance for FMG examinations. These questions are picked up from the concepts which have been asked in the last five years and also few questions which have the potential to appear in your uh, upcoming examinations. And myself, I'm Dr. Saran Reddy, completed my MD anesthesia from PGMA Chandigarh and uh, the academic director of ADA Plexus. Okay. One a very important question when it comes to ASA physical status classification. If you see the, the trend of the questions which have been asked in anesthesia earlier, like five to six years back, predominantly the questions are being asked from anesthetic pharmacology. That is IV drugs, inhalational agents, muscle relaxants, and local anesthetic drugs. But if you see in the last five years, the, it slowly drifted towards the core anesthetic concept, the basics of anesthesia like pre-anesthetic checkup, monitoring, airway, and airway equipment, and related to CPR, Daycare anesthesia, IV cannulas. This is the very clear trend which we are observing the last five years for the FMG examinations, need. Even that the trend will continue in the upcoming next examination also because these areas have become. Uh, Prominent importance considering uh, you, these are the very basics of anesthesia and also to manage the in the patient care and anesthetic pharmacology. With the, it came down from previously it used to be 70 to 80 percent of the questions from anesthetic pharmacology, which came down hardly to 20 30 percent, and there is increase in questions from these particular topics. Okay, now let's go to a few questions. The first question is a grade of brain dead patients for organ donation. The options are two, three four and six. So before going to answer this question, we have to know what is ASA physical status classification? What is ASA? ASA is nothing but American Society of Anesthesiologists Physical Status Classification. Physical Status Classification. So what does it do? It is postulated by a person called Mayer Sackland. And what exactly it does? Every patient who is going to be administered anesthesia, they are classified into six grades. That is one to six. And based upon which grade they fall, considering their comorbidities, what are the medications, based on their comorbidities and what is the status of the medications and their present status, they graded them into six conditions, six grades. So depending upon the severity, uh, as the grade increases from one to six, the morbidity and mortality chances increases. There is um, operating the, the the risk on the operating table increases. So we have to very importantly we have to remember the definitions. A C one, two, three, four, five, six. What is A seven? A seven is a normal healthy person. Without any other comorbidities. For example, a 25-year-old uh, male who uh, just had a pain abdomen with appendicitis, I was diagnosed as appendicitis going for appendicectomy. Otherwise, he is absolutely normal. That's called as ASA1. And ASA2 is a patient with mild systemic disease and ASA4 is a patient with severe systemic disease. So 2 is a patient with mild systemic disease and 4 is a patient with severe systemic disease. Then what shall be 3? It is not moderate. Please remember here also is a patient with severe systemic disease only. So then what is the difference between three and four? Here ASA3 is a patient with severe systemic disease. 
Four is a patient with severe systemic disease with constant threat to life. Constant threat to life. This is if they give a definition per se, a patient with a severe systemic disease with constant threat to life, they fall under which ACP specialist classification? You should answer four. And then five is a moribund patient. A moribund patient who is not expected to survive without surgery. A moribund patient who is not expected to survive without surgery. I will discuss examples in a minute. Six is a brain dead patient. for organ donation. This was a question which was asked a couple of years back. Okay, this was a brain dead patient for organ donation is very, very, very important. And here, patient with, what is meant by patient with mild systemic disease? That is, suppose example, well-controlled diabetes, well-controlled hypertension. What is meant by severe systemic disease? Suppose a, a patient with very poorly controlled uh, diabetes or hypertension or a patient who is a chronic kidney disease patient who is on regular dialysis and four is a patient with a chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury patient and a chronic kidney disease patient on irregular dialysis. What is meant by this moribund patient who is not expected to survive without surgery? The risk of, if you take this person onto the operation theater table, the chances that uh, he will survive is uh, risky that depending upon the surgery and it, surgery is very risky but if you won't take him onto the operation theater and operate he'll definitely die what is an example uh, ruptured aortic aneurysm for a patient with a ruptured aortic aneurysm you may give uh, n amounts of any amounts of fluid and blood but as long as you uh, do the laparotomy and um, depending if it is an abdominal aortic aneurysm if you do laparotomy and Correct that, uh, repair that aortic aneurysm rupture. You it won't, it won't rectify. So that is a patient who is not expected to survive without operations because of this profuse blood loss. He'll be in severe metabolic acidosis. And considering all those things, this patient has to be taken up to the operation theater as early as possible. Okay. Then six is a brain dead patient for organ donation. Do really brain dead patients uh, who are going for organ donation need the anesthesia? Yes, they do. They, it is needed. What is the reason? It is brain dead means the spinal in brain dead the spinal re reflexes below C1 may still be present for effective muscle relaxation. You need still anesthesia. So ASA grade of brain dead for organ donation is D6 is the correct answer. You should never do make mistakes. And two is a patient with mild systemic disease. Three is severe systemic disease. Four is severe systemic disease with constant threat to life. We'll discuss a few examples. Few, there's no need to buy heart few, uh, all the things, but remember, okay, well controlled diabetes or hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes or hypertension. Well controlled is two, poorly controlled is three. And similarly, CKD patients on regular dialysis is three. CKD patients on irregular dialysis. It is chronic kidney disease patients. Okay. Similarly, AKI, acute kidney injury patients. Acute kidney injury patients also belong to ACE4. Okay. Suppose if they ask regarding alcohol, a teetotaler belongs to ACE7. Social alcoholic is ACE2.
alcohol dependencies. Three. Then remember few other important things. Patient with sepsis or disseminated intravascular coagulation fall under four. With multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, it is five. Examples you want to note down for five. Ruptured aortic aneurysm. There will be many, but ruptured aortic aneurysm. Intracranial bleed with mass effect. Intracranial bleed with the mass effect. Okay, this is about the ASF physical status classification. You should remember ASF 1 is a normal healthy person, 2 is a with patient with mild systemic disease, 3 is a patient with severe systemic disease, 4 is a patient with severe systemic disease with constant threat to life, 5 is a moribund patient who is not expected to survive without surgery, and 6 is a brain dead patient for organ donation. Clear? Then we'll go to the next question. A four month old kid is posted for elective urological procedure and he has to be kept fasting from breast milk for how many hours? Very important question. See, usually uh, the options two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours. If it's for adults, usually you have the habit of saying, okay, do overnight fasting and all. But no, there are specific uh, NILPA oral guidelines, NPO guidelines, which say how many hours you have to keep the adults fasting and for um, what food it has to be kept fast. There are specific guidelines for that. Similarly, here they mentioned four month old kid okay, from breast milk for urological procedure. It's an elective procedure. So, how many hours you have to keep them fasting? Understand this. Okay. I don't. In kids, NPO guidelines in children for clear fluids, breast milk formula milk. Solids light meal, solids fatty meal. So in children, the clear fluids, the earlier guidelines say it is two hours, but the recent guidelines say even one hour is sufficient for that. So in the options, if you have both one, two, three, one and two, go for that means they are asking you to, they are expecting you, expecting from you that to answer from the new guidelines that is one hour. Okay, clear fluids means like water, pulpless, orange juice, kind of thing. And breast milk, very important, it is four hours. And formula milk, six hours. In children, semi solids, again, it varies four to six hours. Solids, light meal, six hours. Solids, fatty meal, eight hours. It's in adults, in adults, Clear fluids, semi solids, solids if it is a light meal, solids if it is a fatty meal. Clear fluids it is two hours, semi solids four hours, light solids six hours, fatty solids it is eight hours. This is very, very, very important. Predominantly, you will get questions based on this formula milk and clear fluids and solids, a heavy fatty meal after the eight hours. This is what you have to remember. So in this particular question, as they asked about elective urological procedure for breast milk, the answer is B, four hours. Clear? Then we'll go to the next question. In anesthesia, the fitting of wrong gas cylinder to anesthesia machine can be prevented by pin index system, diameter index system, pressure regulator, gas analyzer. So this is a very, very important question when it comes to anesthesia machine and equipment. See, you see in anesthesia, there will be many cylinders like oxygen, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, many cylinders will be there. So 
when you uh, try to attach the cylinder to the back of anesthesia machine you should attach the appropriate one in the oxygen cylinder port you have to attach only the oxygen one so inadvertently by mistake even if uh, the your assistant tries to bring an another other cylinder there is some safety mechanism just like a lock and key mechanism that is called as pin index safety system if you can see this in anesthesia machine there will be pins pins respective to that particular uh, cylinder and the holes of the, the particular cylinder are present over the anesthesia cylinder. The pin is present over the anesthesia machine. The pin is present over the anesthesia machine and the holes are present over the cylinder wall. So what happens? This pins and holes go on, the pins of the anesthesia machine and holes of the cylinder wall, they go and fit in each other um, perfectly. Only then the anesthesia cylinder will fit. Suppose in, for example, see here, for air it is 1 comma 5 is the pin index. That is the pins in the machine are placed at, at site 1 and 5 points and for oxygen it is 2, 5, nitrous oxide 3, 5. Suppose in the place of the oxygen cylinder where you have to fit here, if you try to bring in the nitrous oxide cylinder, it won't fit. It's just like you are trying to keep a key for a different lock, you, your neighbor's home. It won't work basically. Okay. All the pin index safety system, it has two numbers except Entonox, which is a mixture of oxygen and nitrous oxide. It has single number that is 7. For you to remember, you have to remember at least the pin index of oxygen, which is 2,5, nitrous oxide 3,5, entonox 7. These are very, very, very important. Okay. So then what the answer is pin index safety system. Then what is diameter index safety system? Just like there's a safety system to prevent uh, the anesthesia cylinder to the machine, uh, uh, pin index safety system. Similarly, when you try to fit the pipelines into the anesthesia machine, that is called as diameter index safety system. There is a difference in the diameters of every um, pipeline that is diameter index safety system. As they mentioned about wrong gas cylinder to anesthesia machine, it is pin index safety system. Pin index safety system, very important. And okay, so remember pin index of oxygen is 2,5, nitrous oxide is 3 comma 5 and entonox is 7 okay very important you have to remember this clear then pin is present over the anesthesia machine you see here hole is present over the cylinder wall this is the back side of anesthesia machine where the pin will be present like this can you see this you can appreciate this and you insert the cylinder and lock it this hole is present over the cylinder wall clear then Identify the cylinder by seeing the colors. In this particular question, in this image basic question, they want you to identify the cylinder based on their color. So it has, um, what is the color? The cylinder has a black color and white. It is called as black body, black body with white shoulder. The cylinder which has a black body with white shoulder is oxygen. So what is the color of nitrous oxide cylinder? It is blue, entirely blue. What is the color of carbon dioxide? It is gray. What is the color of air cylinder? Air color is gray body with white shoulder. So it's important to uh, uh, remember about the uh, few colors. This table is very, 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 very important. Air, if you see, the pin index of air. Okay, first of all, the composition. Well, what is the composition or the state in which it exists? Air is stored in air is stored in gaseous form only. Oxygen is stored in gaseous form. Entonox is stored in issues form. But nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and cyclopropane are stored in liquid form. These gases are stored in critical um, uh, in liquid form because their critical temperature is close to the room temperature. And but for air and oxygen, um, it is there. 
it is almost close to minus 190 degrees and minus 130, so it will be different. And what is the pin index? What is the pin index? For air, it is 1 comma 5, oxygen 2 comma 5, nitrous oxide 3 comma 5. For carbon dioxide, it is 1 comma 6 and 2 comma 6, depending upon the percentage of carbon dioxide, 7.5. Just remember 1 comma 6 and 2 comma 6, both are for carbon dioxide. Cyclopropane, it is 3 comma 6. And for internox, it is 7. Then what is the pressure in which it is stored? The pressure is air and carbon dioxide oxygen, it is stored close to 2000 psi. Nitrous oxide close to 760 psi, carbon dioxide is also close to 760 psi, and cyclopropane is close to 75 psi. PSI is a pound squaring, that's the unit of pressure. Then what is the color? So this is a gray body with a white shoulder. This is air. Air exists in gray body with white shoulder. And this is oxygen, black body with white shoulder. Oxygen is black body with white shoulder. Nitrous oxide is completely blue in color, like this. Carbon dioxide is gray color. Cyclopropane is orange in color. Entonox, again, see, it is a blue body with a white shoulder. Is a blue body with white shoulder. Blue body with white shoulder. This is a very, very, very important table where you have to remember about the colors and what are the pin index of uh, these things. Okay, very important, guys. So, as we discussed, oxygen it has black body with white shoulder, so the answer is oxygen. Then, what is true about the Bain circuit? Option A, Mapleson C circuit, option B, circuit of choice in spontaneous ventilation, option C, circuit of choice in pediatric age group. Option D, circuit of choice in controlled ventilation. So before going to this, we'll quickly see about Mapleson circuits. Mapleson circuits are also called as semi-closed circuits. They classified six groups, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So A, B, C, D are used in adults. E and F are used in pediatrics, but B, C, and E are obsolete nowadays. So what are we using A, D, and F? What are the other names? A is Mapleson, A is called as Maigel circuit. B and C, just forget about this. D, the modification of Mapleson D is Bain circuit. Mapleson D, just remember IS, TPs. ISTPs. Mapleton F is called as JR circuit or Jackson Reese circuit. Jackson Reese circuit. Jackson Reese circuit. Okay. So, what are the specialties? You have to remember two to three points about this. The best circuit of choice for spontaneous ventilation. It is the best circuit of choice for spontaneous ventilation in adults. Spontaneous ventilation in adults. And similarly, remember, Bain circuit is the best circuit of choice for controlled ventilation in adults. It is also called as universal circuit. IS circuit we are not using now. Jackson Reese circuit, you have to remember, it is the best circuit for both spontaneous and controlled ventilation 
in children okay and it is usually used in less than 6 years group and with less than 20 kg age group okay this bait circuit is also called as coaxial circuit what is meant by coaxial circuit a tube runs within a tube so one carries the inspiratory and another carries the expiratory gas this is called tube within the tube this is called a coaxial circuit now say this if you can clearly see a green tube running inside a white tube this is called as a coaxial circuit now true about mapleson's bain circuit they asked mapleson c circuit no it is mapleson d circuit circuit of choice in spontaneous ventilation they didn't mention about adults or um, pediatrics but assume as if it's not mentioned specifically that it is in adults in spontaneous ventilation it is mapleson a so it is also wrong circuit of choice in pediatric age group no it is mapleson f circuit of choice in controlled ventilation correct it is um, the circuit of choice in controlled ventilation adults this is true about bain circuit okay clear yeah. then we'll go to the next question the appropriate size of laryngeal mask airway in a 15 kg chair this is very 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 important you're going to get like more and more questions based on laryngeal mask airway once this when you are trying to insert this lma laryngeal mask airway it is not based upon um, if you go for endotracheal tube what you will do based on the age you do that but here laryngeal mask airway when you try to insert it is based upon the weight of the chair so you have to remember this question appeared in in the neat examination for three to four times in the recent years and this is one of the potential questions which will be because uh, in the next uh, upcoming examinations of fmg so there are eight sizes 1 1.5 2 2.5 3 4 and 6 depending upon patient weight please 1 to 5 kg 6 to 10 kg 10 to 20 20 to 30 30 to 50 50 to 70 70 to 100 more than 100 and once you insert you have to inflate that you how much ml it has to be inflated you have to inflate with 4 ml 7 ml 10 14 20 30 40 50 60 this laryngeal mask airway so you when you inflate it because this laryngeal mask airway will be having the cuff here will be having the pilot balloon it inflates once you insert so once you inflate this this laryngeal mask airway it has to be inflated depending upon the size at least 4 ml 7 ml 10 14 depending upon various sizes this we have to uh, make sure we have to keep continuous revision and how to uh, remember this the questions have already appeared based on the patient weight and what are the sizes to be uh, what is the size of laryngeal mask airway to be used in this particular question they asked about laryngeal mask airway in 15 kg child in a 15 kg child the size what you use is size 2 okay 1.5 you use between 6 to 10 here 10 to 20 is 2 2.5 you use between 20 to 30 and 3 you use in between 30 to 50 okay this is about the laryngeal mask airway the appropriate size based on uh, the weight of the child clear please do remember 1 to 5 years size 1 Six sorry, one to five kgs it is size one. Six to ten kgs it is one point five size. Ten to twenty kgs it is size two. Twenty to thirty kgs it is two point five size. Thirty to fifty it is size three. Fifty to seventy it is size four. Seventy to hundred it is five. And more than hundred kgs you insert size six. This is of classic LMA. Okay, then the capnogram showed is suggestive of air embolism, hypoventilation, bronchospasm, and hyperventilation. the capnogram shown here it is it looks like see this is the signature capnogram of shark fin appearance it looks like a shark fin shark fin this is a characteristic of shark fin appearance is characteristic of bronchospasm airway obstruction 
in conditions of COPD asthma. This shark fin appearance is a signature cathogram of bronchospasm, airway obstruction, COPD and asthma. This is one of the most potential questions which you can expect. And in the future years, of the more and more questions are going to come from capnogram. What exactly capnogram means? Capno means carbon dioxide. You are measuring carbon dioxide. at What is meant by capnography? See, at the end of the tidal volume, that is end tidal carbon dioxide, ETCO2, you are measuring carbon dioxide the, at the at the end of the tidal volume, tidal breath. So once you uh, just assume you are taking a breath and you are inhaling and exhaling. Obviously, exhalation is uh, it takes more time than inhalation. So this is how the capnograph looks. Usually, the normal carbon dioxide levels will be between forty to forty-five. Sorry, thirty-five to forty-five. Okay. So what happens exactly? in this particular uh, condition. It is divided into inspiration and expiration. During inspiration, just start from here, it is divided into three phases, phase zero, one, two, three, if, for your understanding purposes, phase zero, one, two, three. In phase zero, what happens? The inspiration phase. Once you start inspiring the oxygen, if you measure the carbon dioxide here, there won't be any carbon dioxide. So phase zero, whatever is the carbon dioxide comes from, this is phase zero. This particular phase, the carbon dioxide comes down. The carbon dioxide is zero. Phase zero is the inspiration phase. Then what is phase one? The expiration starts. Phase one, two, three are all expiration. What happens in phase one? The carbon dioxide, the gas, when you, what are the gas which are coming out from the anatomical dead space is what you see in the phase one. So is there, will there be any carbon dioxide in the anatomical dead space? No, because it didn't participate in the gaseous exchange in the lungs, there, will, there won't be any carbon dioxide. So phase one, there won't be any carbon dioxide. It again remains at the zero level. And phase two, it slowly starts increasing because it is a mixture of anatomical dead space gas and allular gas. Here you'll see only anatomical dead space gas where there's anatomical dead space gas and phase two what is happening it's a mix-up of anatomical dead space gas plus the gas coming from alveoli so from the alveoli the carbon dioxide is coming so slowly it keeps increasing and in phase three what happens the all the gas will be coming out from the alveoli it is purely carbon dioxide it slowly keeps increasing and at the end it stabilizes the carbon dioxide level which you measure at the end of the exhalation is called the end tidal carbon dioxide. So based on this capnography waveform, you can just see like uh, what exactly is happening. So if, if this is a normal capnogram, if you see, Slow increase in ETCO2. Slow increase in ETCO2 is seen in conditions of hypoventilation. And very, very, very important. If you see rapid increase in ETCO2, even touching up to 100, which is normal 35 to 45, there's a rapid increase. Rapid increase is seen in conditions of Malignant hyperthermia, very, very, very important. Malignant hyperthermia. Similarly, slow decrease is seen in hyperventilation and Rapid decrease is seen in pulmonary embolism. This is very, very, very important. Just by seeing the capnography, if there's a rapid increase that indicates the increase in metabolism in the body, that is malignant hypothermia, and rapid decrease is seen in conditions of pulmonary embolism. In addition to these things, you have to remember, more important, as I told you, this prolonged expiratory phase, prolonged phase, phase two and phase three got measured up. That is, it indicates 
the shark fin appearance the signature capnogram of bronchospasm covpd asthma and airway obstruction then in a spontaneous ventilation patient if you see in not just like this these notches are called as curare clefts curare clefts what does that means this indicates in a controlled ventilation patient the patient started breathing spontaneously so the, these are the spontaneous breaths of the patient when the patient is completely anesthetized under anesthesia if the patient if the etc would show this that means the patient is started breathing spontaneously so if these sort of things these curare clefts occur in the middle of the surgery it occurs in the middle of the surgery and during the end of the surgery or after the surgery what does that mean what shall you do if it occurs in the middle of the surgery what that means the patient is coming out of anesthesia the muscle relaxant effect you have to administer more muscle relaxant you have to administer muscle relaxant so the same thing happens at the end of the surgery or after the surgery that means the patient has started having spontaneous breaths so you start giving the reversal agent so that the patient will come out of the muscle relaxant effect so administer reversal agent administer reversal agent okay this is very 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 important you have to remember this clear curare clef during the middle of the surgery administer muscle relaxant at the end of the surgery administer the reversal agent then if you see something like this these are called as cardiogenic oscillations cardiogenic oscillations just remember because of the thin chest wall don't go into complexities of this this is called as cardiogenic oscillations okay these are these are the waveforms which you should at least remember slow increase hypoventilation rapid increase malignant hyperthermia slow decrease hyperventilation rapid decrease pulmonary embolism shark fin appearance in bronchospasm curare cleft seen uh, curare cleft is uh, the dip in that is a spontaneous breath in controlled ventilation and cardiogenic oscillations and if you can one more thing suddenly if the capnogram becomes like this this is called as flat line capnogram suddenly the capnogram it becomes zero that means there's no carbon dioxide like you are not able to trace what are the causes for this flat line capnogram it is because of many things esophageal intubation the endotracheal tube which you are supposed to kept in endo uh, trachea if it is done in esophagus esophageal intubation if there is a circuit disconnection cardiac arrest all these things may lead to flat line capnogram as we discussed about cap cardiac arrest and while doing cpr also how does it mean so normally it is 35 to 45 but while doing cpr you will be having like this from 5 to 10 with every compression you will be seeing this is in cardiac arrest somewhere between close to 5 to 10 which you see in cardiac arrest and suddenly it increases like this till 20 that is something called rosc return of spontaneous circulation the patient is revived return of spontaneous circulation this is very 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 important okay return of spontaneous circulation this capnography itself is a very important topic see here the capnograph showed is suggestive of bronchospasm so in air embolism what happens it, it rapid decrease in hypoventilation what happens slow increase in hyperventilation what happens it is slow decrease in etc good then we'll go to our next question identify the following monitor it is bis by spectral index entropy neuromuscular monitoring or capnography so remember 
even the clue is there in the question. See, sometimes uh, the examiner leaves a few clues in the question. Picking up that clue is also very important. Here it's already written as BIS, but even if it is not there, if there is BIS and entropy are looks similar, but BIS has four leads and entropy has three leads. And neuromuscular monitoring you usually do with the three leads over the hand, the muzzle, two leads. Here, what happens? Why is this? What is this monitor basically? Bispectral index, BIS are bispectral index. This bispectral index. is used to monitor the depth of anesthesia. Monitor the depth of anesthesia. Well, for CNS monitoring, basically. How deep the anesthesia, whether the patient is completely anesthetized or the patient is completely sedated and paralyzed and whether they're able to recollect or whether the patient is completely sedated. Uh, the patient should not recollect anything which happens in the intraoperative thing. So the bispectral index, it ranges from 0 to 100. 0 is a completely silent brain. Hundred is completely awake and active. And remember, the score between forty to sixty is ideal or adequate for anesthesia. This is very, very, very important. Score between 40 to 60 is ideal or adequate for anesthesia. So if at all you have get a question, what is the bispectral index which is ideal for anesthesia? So that is between 40 to 60 is what it, you have to maintain appropriate. Clear? And bispectral index has four leads. You identify this and entropy has three leads. Entropy is also a way of monitoring the CNS monitoring. And neuromuscular monitoring you do with the help of to monitor the muscle relaxant activity and capnography for uh, ventilation and enteral carbon dioxide clear then what is the ideal site to measure core body temperature during general anesthesia see uh, before going to that temperature in the body can be measured through core body temperature intermediate body temperature and surface temperature. Surface temperature is what you do through the skin. And intermediate temperature, you best measure it in the rectum. And core body temperature, again, it is equal to core body temperature and core brain temperature. Core brain temperature is measured in tympanic membrane. Core body temperature is measured in pulmonary artery, distal esophagus, and nasopharynx. So if the question is asked, which the ideal site for core body temperature, it is the pulmonary artery is the ideal site. And for core brain temperature, it is tympanic membrane, intermediate temperature in rectum. So ideal site to measure core body temperature is pulmonary artery, though distal esophagus and tympanic membrane also can use it for to measure the core temperature, but the best is at the level of pulmonary artery. Okay, then, okay, a question from anesthetic pharmacology. Okay, the next question, intravenous anesthetic induction agent used in daycare surgery, propofol, ketamine, etomidate and thioquinone. Here they mentioned about daycare surgery. Where, what is meant by daycare surgery? In daycare surgery, the patient will be admitted, operated, and discharged on the same day. For a drug to be administered in daycare surgery, the drug should be having a rapid induction and rapid recovery. Among the IV anesthetic agents, induction agents, propofol has that property of rapid induction and rapid recovery. So propofol is the IV anesthetic induction agent of choice for daycare surgery. So in daycare surgery, the drugs of choice, if it is IV induction agent, it is propofol. Coming to inhalational, 
it is in adults, desflurane in kids, it is sevoflurane. If it is in muscle relaxant, use mevacurium because of its rapid onset and duration of action. Then coming to opioids, use remifentanil. If it is in uh, benzodiazepines. age pins, Injured as it is, it is Remy Majolum. These are the day case, uh, the drugs of choice for day case surgery. IV induction agent, propofol, inhalation in adults, desflurane, kids, sevoflurane, and muscle relaxant, mevacurium, opioids, Remy Fentanyl, and benzoyl diazepines, Remy Majolum. Clear. Now, going to the next question. Minimum alveolar concentration of an inhaled anesthetic is a marker of potency, speed of induction, speed of recovery and distribution. See, minimum alveolar concentration. Just try to understand this concept. MAC or minimum alveolar concentration. What does that mean? So, medicine is, as I always say, medicine is half English. The minimum concentration of the anesthetic gas, in, this is used in inhalation reagents. The minimum concentration of the inhalation reagent which is which should be present in the alveoli to make 50% of the patients going to sleep or anesthetized is what our target is. So the drug among the air we breathe in the 100% with the minimum percentage of that particular drug, if the patient get anesthetized, the 50% of the people get anesthetized is what MAC is. Minimum alveolar concentration is the percentage of anesthetic gas required the percentage of anesthetic gas required so that 50% of the patients do not respond to surgical stimuli. So once any surgical stimuli is given, reflexly will try to withdraw. That reflex should not be there, at least in 50% of the patients, with the minimum percentage of the gas which is present. So my, if it is, suppose, for example, among the 100 percentage of air we breathe in, you need 1 percentage of certain gas to get 50% of the people anesthetized. You need 5% of another drug and 10 percentage of another drug to anesthetize. To get the same effect, you need 1% of X drug, 5% of Y drug, 10% of Z drug to get the same effect. So which is more potent? Obviously, X is more potent because with just 1%, it is getting the same effect what Y is giving at 5% and Z is giving at 10%. So MAC is an indicator of potency. MAC is indirectly proportional to potency. Less is the MAC, more potent is the drug. So the most potent inhalational anesthetic agent is most potent inhalational agent is methoxyfluorine. Most potent methoxyfluorine. It is 0 0.95. Then least potent is Though we won't consider as uh, nitrous oxide and all those things, nitrous oxide as a carrier gas has 104. So even if you do completely, um, instead of air or oxygen, if you do complete nitrous oxide, the patient would not get uh, the complete surgical relaxation. Okay, least least potent is nitrous oxide. How do you remember? See, methoxyfluorine 0.15. Halothane 0.75, isoflurane 1, sevoflurane 2, 
that's three and six. So as how can you remember if they ask you to ascend um, a lot? I mean, arrange in ascending or descending sequence. Remember Mahendra Singh Dhoni. MHD is his three-letter uh, nickname, and Mahi is another nickname. So just take it, Mahi Singh Dhoni, Mahi HD. So M is methoxyflurane with 0.15, halothane with 0.75, isoflurane one, sevoflurane two, desflurane six. So as you go from M to D, what happens? The MAC value increases similarly the potency decreases very important guys clear you have to remember so mac is an indicator of potency the speed of induction and speed of recovery depends upon the blood gas partition coefficient blood gas partition coefficient okay so MAC, minimum molar concentration of nil and stick is a marker of potency. Speed of induction and recovery depends on blood gas partition coefficient. Okay? Then, what are the drugs excreted by Hoffman's elimination? Galamine, atracurium, procaine, thiopentone. Okay. So here, basically Hoffman's elimination, it is uh, when by the muscle relaxant. Here, the procaine is basically even without knowing if they are given other muscle relaxant options, you might have confused, but here it is straightforward. Procaine is a local anesthetic drug. Thiopentone is an IV anesthetic, IV induction agent drug. And galamine is also a type of uh, muscle relaxant, but uh, it is not of use uh, because it crosses the blood-brain and placental barrier, you won't use this. Here the answer is straightforward, atracurium. But remember, what is the importance of Hoffman's elimination? See, these drugs, atracurium and cisatracurium. So usually what happens, all the anesthetic muscle relaxant drugs, they either get metabolized or eliminated in liver, kidneys, or bile. So what happens if the drug is metabolized or eliminated in the particular organs, if that particular organ is deranged, what happens if they can't properly um, eliminate from the body and they have prolonged action to prevent that we need so if there is a patient if there's a drug which is getting excreted to the kidney and the patient has a renal failure so you can't use that particular drug in that patient and if the patient uh, the drug metabolizes in the liver and there's a patient has a liver failure you can't use that particular drug in liver failure and so this atracurium and cisatracurium the you know, the advantage of this and the beauty of these things is they won't metabolize neither metabolize or eliminate neither through kidney nor through the liver or bile. What it does? They metabolize to something called two pathways. One is Hoffman's elimination. This is a rapid. This is nothing but Hoffman's elimination is nothing but spontaneous non-enzymatic degradation. No uh, proper metabolism. They me non-enzymatically they degrade uh, into circulation non-enzymatic degradation and another mechanism is slow ester hydrolysis so this half minute elimination slow ester hydrolysis structure doesn't depend on doesn't metabolize or eliminate in liver or kidney so this atracurium is the drug of choice, muscle relaxant of choice in liver failure, renal failure, even it is the most commonly drug used in pediatrics and geriatrics. So Hoffman's elimination is seen in atracurium and cisatracurium. Very, very, very important point. Hoffman's elimination is atracurium. Then, which is the most cardiotoxic local anesthetic drug? This question was recently in indirect way it was asked in the recent INSET examination. So, is the, the uh, one of the potential questions for the exam? Most cardiotoxic local anesthetic. The most cardiotoxic local anesthetic is bupivacaine. And lignocaine, prilocaine, amagropiocaine, most cardiotoxic is uh, bupiocaine. And remember a few points. Bupiocaine most cardiotoxic local anesthetic drug. 
So what does it cause? It may cause ventricular arrhythmias, if you use additional drug, it may cause cardiotoxicity. So how do you treat this ventricular arrhythmias? You can use either amiodarone, procainamide, or bretillium. The question which was asked in the recent examination is, how do you use, treat this bupivacaine-induced cardiotoxicity? It is very important. 20% intralipid formulation. The drug itself is 20% intralipid formulation. It looks like a clear milk kind of, a thick milk kind of the cardiotoxicity. 20% intralipid formulation. And remember one important point. Cardiac arrest which occurs with bupivacaine. Cardiac arrest with bupivacaine toxicity. is very difficult to revive. Cardiac arrest with bupivacaine toxicity is very difficult to revive. Okay, Bupivacaine is the most cardiotoxic localistic drug which causes ventricular arrhythmias and treated with amiodarone, procainamide and bretillium and cardiotoxicity is seen 20% intralipid. The cardiotoxicity you treat with 20% intralipid formulation and ropevacaine has less cardiotoxic and CNS effects when compared with the bupivacaine and prilocaine it is notorious for myth hemoglobinemia it causes myth hemoglobinemia and lignocaine if you want if you, lignocaine with preservative lignocaine with preservative can cause cardi equina syndrome Third equina syndrome, very important. Okay, then coming to the next question. In spinal anesthesia, the drug is deposited between ligamentum flavum and dura, dura and interspinous ligament, pia and arachnoid, dura and arachnoid. For this, you have to remember uh, where the to drug uh, where the drug is deposited. You have to see, like you have to remember what are the structures that are pierced once you are trying to uh, inject a spinal anesthetic drug. So if you see this, the structures we have pierced starting with skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, Dura matter and arachnoid membrane. So these are the three ligaments: supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and ligament of flavor. So skin, subcutaneous tissue, and then you pierce here. See, skin, subcutaneous tissue. Here is the supraspinous ligament. This is the interspinous ligament and ligament of flavor. Then dura, and after piercing the arachnoid, you give in the subarachnoid space subarachnoid space that is you inject the drug between the arachnoid membrane and pia matter so between pia and arachnoid is the correct answer clear so what happens in if the same question they ask in epidural anesthesia the drug is deposited between in epidural above the dura epidural the drug is deposited in above the dura at this point you deposit the drug in epidural that is between ligament of flavum and dura. Here, between ligament of flavum and dura, you use epidural anesthesia. Okay. This is what you have to remember. In spinal anesthesia, the drug is deposited between pia and arachnoid, but in epidural, it is deposited between ligament of flavum and dura. Clear? Then, identify the following needle. We take a Identify the following needle. Whittaker, Sprotty, Tuhai, Quinky. So, heard, remember, this is an 18 gauge Tuhai needle which is used for epidural anesthesia. So, this is complete set of epidural anesthesia where this is the Tuhai needle. This is 
the LOR syringe, loss of resistance syringe, and this is the epidural catheter. So once you inject the drug, once you go into the epidural space, once you feel the loss of resistance, then you insert this epidural catheter and you can keep using for this for three to five days for prolonged post-operative pain relief. Okay, why is this yellow or what is this loss of resistance? So see this example. Once you go into, you have to give above the dura after the ligament of flavor. So while you're going, while you're pacing through skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament and ligament of flavor, you'll feel a little bit of resistance. Once you feel, once you pierce this ligament of flavor, there'll be giveaway. That loss of resistance feeling is, it helps in identification of the epidural space, okay? This is l syringe. This is 18 gauge to high needle. So what are Whittaker's Sprotty and Twinkie? These are basically spinal needles. See here. Sprotty and Whittaker, Twinkie. These are all spinal needles. The Sprotty and Whittaker are pencil tip needles, pencil tip type of needles. And Twinkie is cutting type of needles. Cutting type of needles. So the advantages and disadvantages. The squinky is technically easy. Technically easy, but increased chances of PDPH, post-dural puncture headache. But this pencil tip needles are to insert are technically difficult. Technically difficult, but decrease the chances of post-dural puncture headache. Okay. So the pencil tip needles are sprotty vitacker, cutting needle is quinky, and the question here mentioned is uh, the epidural catheter with too high needle. Okay. 18 gauge too high needle. Okay. Come to the next question. Very, very, very important questions which have been asked almost in every examination nowadays is the color of IV cannulas. The color of IV cannulas and the flow with which they use. Okay. If you see the color of intravenous IV cannulas, 14 gauge is orange in color, 16 gauge is gray in color, 17 gauge is white in color, 18 gauge is green in color, 20 gauge is pink in color, 22 is blue, 24 is yellow. And there is another 26 gauge, which is purple in color. Very important. So what are the other questions? They may ask you another way. They may give an image based question with this 18 gauge, uh, with this green color and ask you to identify. This is very important. Don't try to remember this by mnemonics. Just by seeing it, try to analyze because the mnemonic itself will become difficult. 14 gauge is iron, 16 is gray, 17 is white, 18 is green, 20 is pink, 22 is blue, 24 is yellow, 26 is purple or violet. So what are the question, other questions they may ask you? What is the most commonly used uh, IV cannula in polytrauma? 16 gauge is what you use in polytrauma. Okay, 16 gauge is what you use most commonly in polytrauma. Then 18 and 20 are most commonly used. 22 you use in kids. 24 you commonly use in infants and 26 you use in neonates. Okay, this is what you have to uh, remember about this. Then what is, if they ask you, what is maximum flow? In a minute, what is the maximum flow that you can use through this? What is the maximum amount of fluid you can give through this? Remember roughly 14 gauge, it is 270 ml. 16 gauge, 180 ml. This is per minute, per minute. 270 ml, 180 ml, 9. You about right 90 ml, 60 ml, it's close to 45 ml, close to 22 to 30 ml, 15 to 20 ml. This is how you have to remember what is the max the amount of fluid that can be given in a single minute. Um, with the maximum flow, is with the orange, it is um, 270, 16 gauge, 180 ml, with the 18 gauge, it is 90 ml, 20, it is 60 ml, 22 gauge, close to 45, 24, 22 to 30, 26, 15 to 20 ml. Clear. And then IV cannulas here, the color of 20 gauge IV cannula is pink in color. What is blue? Green. What is yellow? 
yellow is basically 24, blue is 22, green is 18. Okay. Yellow is 24, blue is again 22, and green is 18. Clear. So the IV candles are very, very important. Till now, they didn't ask about the flows, but also it's wise to remember uh, the flow so that the in, if at all they ask you the, the potential examinations, you'll be um, prepared to answer. Clear. Then coming to all of the next question, all of the following are reversible causes of cardiac arrest except hypoxia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, acidosis. So whenever a cardiac arrest occurs, while you are treating that patient with, depending upon whether it's a shockable rhythm or non-shockable rhythm, when you keep giving the drugs, adrenaline, amadrone, and all these things, simultaneously you have to work out what is the cause for that cardiac arrest? Are there any reversible causes of cardiac arrest? If, if there are reversible cardiac uh, cause of uh, reversible cause of cardiac arrest, if you if you reverse that particular cause, the patient may recover fast. So what are the reversible causes of cardiac arrest? It is called five. You have to remember with you can remember with easily with the mnemonic five H and five T. The reversible causes of cardiac arrest. Five H and five T. Five H or hypoxia. Hypovolemia or hypotension. Same. H plus IM, that is acidosis, hypothermia, then hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, both can cause cardiac arrest. So what are 5T? Tension pneumothorax, Cardiac tamponade, cardiac tamponade, toxins, coronary thrombosis, pulmonary thrombosis. So these are 5H and 5T. 5H is hypoxia, hypovolemia, or hypotension, H plus I am acidosis, hypothermia, hypokalemia or hypokalemia, and 5T are tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, toxins, coronary thrombosis, or pulmonary thrombosis. This is very, very important. Before all, any of these causes are there. If you can reverse them or treat them, so immediately the patient also will improve. So you can you have to keep while you the CPR resuscitation protocol is going on, still you have to keep searching for this. Okay. And all of the following are reversible cause of cardiac arrest. Hypoxia, yes. Hypocalcemia, no. Hyperkalemia is a reversible cause of cardiac arrest. Acidosis, that is H plus ion, that is metabolic acidosis. It is also a reversible cause of cardiac arrest. So as they're asked about the except, it is hypocalcemia. And okay. So when they ask about reversible cause of cardiac arrest, you have to remember the 5H and 5T, hypoxia, hypovolemia or hypotension, H plus and acidosis, hypothermia, hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, and 5T are tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, toxins, coronary thrombosis, and pulmonary thrombosis. Very important. And these are the few questions uh, from anesthesia which have been picked up from the topics which have been of importance in the recent examinations and the which you may expect the questions in the upcoming examinations okay and remember a, a question gained anywhere in any subject is very important is you will get that mark and what is the, what are the keys for success remember revision as much as doing revision every day spend before you go to sleep 15 to 20 minutes Try to just quickly flip through the pages, whatever you have read that for that particular day. And next day morning, you wake up again, go through 15, 20 minutes, again, spend on what you have read the previous day. So this helps um, in subconsciously having the impact and you will you'll be revising multiple times like this. If you think that I'll read for entire week and I'll do it on Sunday, this 15 to 20 minutes every day, is of more value than spending 10 hours for revision on a Sunday. 
okay this is very important doing revision and second most important thing learning from mistakes you might have made multiple mistakes in various examinations like grand tests or your mock tests or when you do the class tests practice tests whatever it might be so if a mistake a mistake once done is a mistake if a mis the same mistake done twice is no more a mistake and it's a choice you you made you are you are doing it by choice so how do you prevent that whatever the mistakes which have been done try to write two to three lines in your a, a book learning from mistakes and try to write down there so what happens before before the examination when you try to revise it you you made sure that there's no mistakes will be repeated so it'll be easier for you um, for a quick revision and as many mistakes as you made during your preparation time you consolidate those topics so that those will won't be repeated in the final examination these are the two most important things and the third being doing as many mcqs as possible as many mcqs as possible keep doing as many mcqs at least make sure you do 50 mcqs in a time and fashion and whatever the mistakes is done again uh, write it down in learning from mistakes and more ahead guys okay these are the three most important things and we'll keep discussing a uh, few more in your in our few uh, future sessions okay and thank you all the very best guys see you in the next session have a nice day